This R302 video takes you through an introduction to Laban and his efforts and exertions. So Rudolf Laban, also known as Rudolf van Laban, was born in 1879 and he died in 1958. He was born in Posny, which is, was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is today known as Bratislava in Slovakia. And you can see it's in red on the map to the right. He was born into an aristocratic family. Now, what does this mean? Aristocratic families are of the noble classes, um, often have titles, they have money and wealth. He studied architecture first in Paris, and during this time he became interested in the relationship between the moving human form and the space that surrounds it. It seems like quite a leap from architecture to movement. However, if we think carefully about it, both are interested in space and how space is occupied. So maybe not as far removed from each other as it initially seems. He became interested in the movement arts at around the age of 30, and he later became both a performer and a choreographer. What exactly is a choreographer? A choreographer is a person who makes up dances. Around 1919, his career took off in Germany and he became rather successful with a dance theatre company, a chamber dance theatre company, a school, a movement choir for amateurs, and he was also involved in writing articles and books and he performed and created dance works. He had a period of success after that, and over the next 10 years, he created 25 Laban schools and choirs for the education of children and amateurs, including men and professional dancers. And his schools were in a variety of different places in Europe. He was recognized as an intellectual in the field of dance, theater, and movement study, and was at the height of his career. However, if you remember, on the, um, the previous slide, we said he was in Germany. And Germany at this time was starting to go through the beginnings of the Second World War. Um, and his name and work was destroyed by the Nazi government propaganda ministry. And this was around 1936, which was at the beginning of the Second World War. So he moved to Britain in 1938 as a refugee from Nazi Germany. And Everything that he established there had been destroyed, as was uh, um, with a lot of people in the Second World War. He was also now a lot older, and in Britain at the age of 60, he started to look at the way people move in industry, and he studied methods to increase production through humane means. Um, I read a story about him being involved in a factory at around the time of the Second World War, and he was involved in trying to assist the people working on the production line to be more efficient, to use their bodies more efficiently in um, what they were doing in this factory. He died in 1958 at the age of 79, but a lot of his ideas have um, continued and continue to be relevant today. So his ideas have generated innovations in dance, acting, performance, in the study of nonverbal communication, in ergonomics, ergonomics is using your body optimally, in educational theory, child development, personality assessment, and psychotherapy. So we can see from this list that his reach is far greater than simply dance and movement. So he was interested in how the body moved in a natural way, which is what we're interested in in our creative movement section. Laban Guild said in 2017, Rudolf Laban found a fascination in observing people's movements in all aspects of life. His analysis of movement is based on anatomical, spatial and dynamic principles. What the body can do, how it does it, how it relates to space, and how the quality of the movement affects function and communication. And he applied his work and movement to all human movement. So he wasn't simply interested in dance. Maybe it started out as an interest in dance, but then went on to an interest in the way that humans move in a variety of contexts, not just dance. Rudolf Laban 
broke movement down into two sections, namely exertions and efforts. And here we have a quote from Coney that says, effort can be described as the dynamics, the qualitative use of energy, texture, color, emotions, inner attitude, etc. There is an ongoing, which is flow, sense of self, which is weight, in relation to the environment, which would be the space, over time, which of course relates to the time. And these four things, flow, weight, space, and time, are the four exertions. There they are again. So weight can be strong or light. It can be, space can be direct or flexible. Time, sudden or sustained. And flow can be bound or free. And we're going to speak about each of these in a little bit more detail. First of all is weight. So if we look at the actual definition of weight, it is the amount of pull of the Earth's gravity on the body. So that is what is measured when you stand on a scale. Weight is measured in kilograms and grams. But for Laban, he said it was more than this. He was interested in how a large person can walk in a way that is as light as a feather. Yet sometimes we get small or light people who are really heavy in their movements. So what happens to the weight in these cases? How is it that dancers can jump in the air and land without any noise? So these were some of the questions that Laban wanted to address about weight. Laban was also interested in the kinetic force that was needed. So this is when the body senses or works out how much force is needed to do a certain movement. So, for example, if you're going to be looking at pushing a car, you know that you're going to have to really engage your muscles and push quite hard. It's going to be a totally different feeling to pushing a pram, for example. If you pushed a pram with the same amount of force that you pushed a car, well, the pram would go shooting forward. Conversely, if you pushed a car with the amount of force that you needed to push a pram, well, that car might just run you over. Um, Kinetic sensing has to do with when we pick up objects. So if you see a piece of paper on the floor and you bend down to pick it up, you're going to use a lot less effort than if you're picking up a pail of water, for example. So when looking at Laban's um, exertions, weight refers to the degree of body tension required for performing an action. So how much tension do you need? How much do you need to engage your muscles to do something? It's measured on a continuum from firm to fine. Firm tension involves tight and powerful muscles. So think about pushing that car, the way your muscles would be engaged before you did it. Fine tension involves a light tension in the muscles, a soft touch. Here you have the continuum, so all the way from strong firm, which would be powerful, standing ones, ground, immovable, all the way to light, delicate, fragile, buoyant, lifted up, etc. Space is the picture in which the dancer creates a lively image. There are different types of space. We can think about personal space. This is the space that is close to the individual body. It is best um, recognized by when somebody is in your personal space. So we all know what that feels like. It is uncomfortable and um, you feel as though somebody is invading your space. General space is space that is shared. So if you think about a lecture venue, we are sharing the space. This is the general space. Negative space is your unoccupied personal space. So think of yourself with an aura around you or sort of five to ten centimeters of air around you and that is your unoccupied personal space. I think also if you were to put your hand on your hip you would create a triangular shape between your elbow and your body and that would be your negative space. So it is a space that belongs to you but to that space that you're not necessarily occupying at that particular time. And positive space refers to our occupied personal space. So the space that we're actually using at a specific time. You can see in this picture, um, the idea of negative space. In the picture on the left, we have a vase and the vase is in the positive space and everything around it that is sort of light gray is in the negative space. 
However, in the picture on the right hand side, the white in the middle would be the negative space and the two faces, one on either side of the um, white, would be in the positive space. Okay, our next exertion is time. So although we are surrounded by clocks, everyone responds to time in different ways. And we have people who are naturally slow and sustained, and some people are naturally quick and sudden, fast in their movements. The duration of a movement or series of movements can range from short to very, very long. And we can create quite a difference in the movement that we do if we do it slowly um, or if we do it very short or suddenly. Sudden involves an immediate, often surprising action. At the other end of the continuum, the body takes time to execute a single action. The movement is sustained, lingering and ongoing. In the vocabulary, some actions are sudden, such as freeze, bounce and stamp. Others are sustained, like settle and sink. So time exists on this continuum all the way from sustained, which are movements which are lingering, drawing out, prolonging, leisurely, all the way to things that are quite quick or sudden, urgent, instantaneous, staccato, quick, hurried, now. And time can happen anywhere across that continuum. Flow. We usually associate flow with liquid. Thinner liquid flows faster. But flow describes movement that is unimpeded and continuous. Flow indicates a liberation of movement. The opposite is a movement that is broken up and jerky, where we're stopping and starting, and the flow seems to be interrupted. So Laban said that flow can be free flow or bound flow. And free flow is the first. The movement is unimpeded, continuous, difficult to stop. Whereas bound flow is broken up, jerky, and has the quality of stopping and starting. So here we have it again. Free flow, completely unimpeded, difficult to stop suddenly. The dancer is confident. The movement is fluid. On the other hand, we have bound flow. The movement is tentative. It can be stopped at any given moment. For example, you are stroking a dog that might bite you. Your hand is ready to retract as soon as you need to. Or if you're performing a task that requires care, such as painting a window frame, this would also be bound flows because if you make any kind of error, you can stop immediately. The body can move in a continuous motion or movement can be interrupted and come to an abrupt halt, binding the flow. You can introduce the concept of flow by exploring speedily tumbling with the body close to the floor and then suddenly halting the movement, binding it in unexpected positions. So if you were to fall to the floor, um, it would be difficult to stop halfway. So we would say that is a free flow. And here we have our continuum again. So we have free flowing on the one side, outpouring, letting the inside out, letting the outside in, uncontrollable, open-hearted, fluid. And on the other end, we have movements that are bound, contained, controlled, keeping the inside in and the outside out, can be stopped at any moment, they're rigid, and boundaries are set up. In addition to the exertions, Laban created eight efforts. So here we have pressing, flicking, ringing, dabbing, slashing, gliding, punching or thrusting, and floating. And we'll discuss each of these in a little bit more detail. Our first um, effort here is pressing. So if you think about pressing your hand on something, if you press down on the table, it's going to be heavy, direct, sustained, and strong. If you compare this to flicking, flick a piece of fluff off your jacket. This movement is going to be flexible, sudden and light. It is a small and delicate movement and again we don't just think about flicking our fingers, we can actually flick any part of our body. You can flick your foot, you can flick your head. This um, movement as we said though is a light and sudden. Ringing. Think about wringing out a towel. 
This movement is flexible, but it is sustained. It takes time and it is strong. Dabbing. So this movement is direct, sudden and light. Think about dabbing suntan lotion on yourself, for example. A little bit like flicking, but it's got a directness to it and also slightly heavier perhaps than flicking might be. Next we have slashing. Think about slashing a sword through the air. It's a strong, sudden movement. Um, an angry person perhaps. Gliding. Think about the way a butler would glide silently into a room, confident and cool. It is a sustained, light, direct movement. Thrusting or punching. It is again a strong movement, direct and sudden. A little bit like slashing perhaps, but slashing which is kind of quite wild and uncontrolled. Thrusting or punching in contrast has a definite direction to the movement. Floating. Floating is flexible, sustained and light. So think about drifting on air or a cork bobbing on the ocean. Here is a table where you can see each of the efforts on the left with the weight, space, time and flow that would be ascribed to each one.